hey, here's here's a way you could change your workflow based on everything that you've seen out in the world. And if would you like to? Right. Or think of something. If I'm an operations manager, um, you know, you could say your uh, account paper workflow is up 12 percent over this time last year, um, and it's trending towards being up 20 percent. You may need to put a, open up a rec for you know another operations specialist. There's all sorts of things like that that we could really use for AI. I mean, we're, we're just scratching the surface with it. Hey there, it's Mike Lagrin. Welcome to another episode of the Augmented Advisor Podcast, where we showcase thought leaders, ideas, and strategies to help improve the advisor and client experience in wealth management. The Augmented Advisor Podcast is brought to you by Blue Leaf, the all-in-one wealth management platform and best-in-class advisor and client experience in reporting, billing, and rebalancing. And I feel a little awkward saying this because... John Prendergast is here in person with me. In person. (laughs) And we have an incredible special guest, Ryan George, the chief marketing officer of DocuPace with us. For what promises to be uh, an amazing conversation. So uh, It'll be amazing. Absolutely no question. Welcome to Texas, dude. It's always big in Texas, isn't it? (laughs) It's always hot in Texas. It is always hot in Texas. Yes. It's nuts. It's nuts. It's, It's really interesting, you know. You know, you, you start to get used to it, but then you don't. When they, when, like last summer, I was definitely not. Yeah, because you came from the Northeast. I did. So <laughs> it makes me think, what's wrong with you? Like, I can't imagine getting used to this heat. I'm born and raised here, and come July, everybody's indoors. We're staying indoors. If you go outside, it's going to take lots of cold water and beer and good barbecue. Beer Absolutely. and barbecue. That's actually what That's I That's why people live in Texas, right there. <laughs> That's what I learned like the first summer I was here because it was we had a record in Austin for uh, almost 100 days in a row of 100 degree temperatures and it rained like twice that entire summer. It was nasty, right? It was really, really hot. So you just learn to walk slow, stay in the shade, drink beer. (laughs) Walk, you learn to drive everywhere you go. That's what it is. (laughs) Even to your neighbors next door. Yes. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, the public transportation is uh, not really the thing (laughs) they do here in Austin. All right. Well, why don't we dive into this thing, man? I'm really excited Let's about this. Make it this. happen. Uh, we're going to be diving in deep on the topic of client experience and wealth management today. So I thought a great way to kick things off might be to have us lay a bit of a foundation. I, I know this question uh, is asking you to paint with a bit of a broad brush, but what is it about the client experience in wealth management that you find lacking today? I would assume the answer, in your case, starts with paper. Sure. I mean, paperwork's a part of it, but I think just the experience in general, are people really stripping away everything and looking at what the experience they're delivering, both at the you know, big broker dealer or provider level, as well as down to the specific advisor and segmentation among their clients. I think every client deserves to have an experience that matches what their needs are, and I think we're still got a ways to go to get there. Yeah, you know, documentation has been so difficult and fragmented at the custodians. It's it's really astonishing, and it's not like there's a uniform uh, set of APIs that you can plug into. I mean, w- what's happening here that, that allows you to actually do what you do? There's a lot of work. Um, so what we do is we work with all the custodians, and we partner with Quick, which provides some forms bundling. Um, so you've got, in any account aggregation or account application setup, you've got the clearing firm, you've got the IBD or RA firm, forms that, which can be specific to them. Then you can have a um, product-specific forms, depending on what type of account you're setting up. And all of that can create a, quite a bit of dynamic when trying to get the right things together, but also giving it to your client and say, here's the stack of paperwork. We're going to walk all the way through. It's going to be a six-point font. It's going to be lots of stuff that I'm going to tell you to ignore, even though I shouldn't. And I think that's the problem. There's, there's no standard. So you look at the sort of investor relations field. There's XBRL, which put in early 2000s. It's helped standardize and get it more data ready. Mm-hmm. We should move somewhere like that. We should move to of where course. where you have more standard standardization of the data that's gathered, so it makes it easier on everybody. Yeah, you know, one of the things you said in our earlier call when we were prepping for all of this was that the the industries let these complications of the wealth management experience kind of flow down to the client experience unnecessarily. I'd love to unpack that a little bit because you know it's really critical for. Uh, advisors and wealth management leaders to understand it. Sure. I think 
when I said that, I think what I meant was, you know, we have changing regulations and changing dynamics. And so to comply with those new dynamics, we just force it down to the client instead of making it easier for the client to comply. And that's just one example of how the complexity works. Another one would be uh, integration among systems. So the client has to, depending on the system, the client would have to enter one system to do e-signature or enter another system to do get their um, their client data to get, you know, do performance reporting. And I think there's just all this complex web that has sat behind the scenes, and we've sort of let that monster get out in front of the audience, and I think we need to figure out a way to pull it. So it's as if we've used the client as the point of integration. True. I mean, that is the point where the rubber meets the road, and I think we We've done so maybe, I think it's been unintentionally, I think we've all been trying to comply with the fast moving things and with fast moving technology, what you saw with COVID is you saw this rapid adoption of digital tools, but we just basically took the analog way we use them and made them into digital world. So I think now we're, you know, years since then, I think we're getting a little bit better. We're talking more about optimization, especially within a down economy, but, but we have a long way to go. You know, a friend of mine once said that uh, the financial services industry was built on information scarcity and complexity, right? The average financial consumer ne knows next to nothing about wealth management. They don't understand what stocks, bonds, and mutual funds are. They don't understand uh, insurance products and so forth. So, you know, for generations, the industry thrived on the notion that this investing stuff was just too complicated and too opaque for those consumers to understand. And therefore we needed to have a financial advisor who could, or, or a stockbroker who could charge a big commission and so forth. Uh, but we've moved quickly now into a new era where information is abundant, right? It's really easy to find, like think about buying a new car as an example. It used to be really complicated. You needed to have a sales guy. And now it's like you have all the information about pricing and specs and so forth when you walk in. Um, and it's getting easier to understand this stuff too because you can just Google it and have get a pretty easy explanation. So now creating a wealth management experience seems to be more about advising, right? You have, the advisor has to be a better guide and so forth. What are your thoughts on how advisors themselves must adapt in the face of having easy access to information? Well, this is part of the maturation. So back in the days that you're talking about, you'd have a broker. And the reason they were called a broker because they had all the keys to the doors that you couldn't get yeah. into, right? So they would charge you $95 a trade in order to you know, transact that stock or transact that bond, you know, over the past 20 years or so, all those walls have come down and we have access. But to your point, I still think we're missing information. We're still missing valuable information that can really help investors that's dynamic to them. Um, and I think we're, we're getting closer. I think a lot of the stuff, if you look at sort of personal finance sites and personal finance publications, they're all very general, you know, maximize your tax deferred savings and do other things like that. Well, that may be good for most people, but it may, like, not all the people. And so I think the changing role of the advisor is to be specific, learn what the client's goals are, not when they're 65 and not when they're 75 or 85. What's their goal when they're 50, if they're 40? What's the goal when they're 55? You know, how do you increment and get some checkpoints along the way to be successful? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, your, your business is automating the documents and you, you talked about, you know, we, we got a lot of information now, but we don't have all of it. We're, we're still missing some. And it made me think about, in some ways, we've got the reverse problem where you've got information duplication in many silos, right? You've got, um, you've got in fact, data, but not information. There's a whole field around this in other industries, master data management, which, which is designed to pull together something into kind of a golden record. You know, and it made me think, you know, isn't that kind of sort of part of the role of DocuPace in some ways to just, you gotta op operate the paperwork, but in some sense, you are also in the middle of it in a way that you can start to pull that information together to create kind of a golden record. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think one of the ways that we're trying to move into is into data management. So how can we help? We have connectivity, so we're one of the most integrated softwares in any technology stack that a wealth management provider has, just because of where we sit. So we sit close to the CRM, close to the financial planning software, clearly close to the documentation, and then connect to the custodian. So we have information flowing left and right, backwards and forwards throughout our system. With that, I think there's an opportunity for us to take that data and actually you know, create a, a data store that's valuable to them, but also use AI and other tools to manage that data to create opportunities within the business or highlight things. And, make it smarter, we're, we're a ways from there, we're working toward it, but I think 
that's one of the things that makes us excited about some of the new AI tools and other things is that you can start small and you can deliver one thing and that's an uplift and you can deliver another thing and that's an uplift. I think advisors have still had a fear of some of these new technologies because they think it replaces mm. you know, the advisor role that they give. They just need to adapt to more of what they, mm-hmm. they're not gonna call up ChatGPT and say, should I sell my portfolio today? <laughs> Let's, a, ho- let's hope not. Yeah, they, let's hope not. But also, um, ChatGPT is not going to talk them down if they want to. And I think that's a critical role that advisors will continue to play, which is just being a sounding board and being a piece of calm, a sense of calm whenever, you know, times like now are happening. Well, AI is an interesting topic, and we could do a whole show on that. <laughs> but I think for most advisors, the way you want to think about AI and ChatGPT, which is generative AI, is that it's like having a very talented, very smart junior person that will help you that also lies. <laughs> <laughs> it will lie. Well, what's really funny about, so you just mentioned something, generative AI. Excuse me, I can say that five times fast, right? Generative AI, meaning it generates <laughs> stuff, right? And that's an important distinction when we start talking about AI because a lot of people think about AI as just, historically, it's been this, automated solution, right? It's kind of, we've called it AI, but really not. It's like you press a button and it just does a, a bunch of like steps. Like most technologies, it's been mislabeled. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And now we have something that you put some information in and it, it will generate some content. Now, to mm-hmm. your point, it might lie. It might not be 100% accurate, but it's getting better, right? It'll create some stuff for you based on some questions or some instructions you give it. And that can be really helpful for an advisor or for anybody else, frankly. As a starting point, yeah, right? As, as a as a framework, as a set of ideas. Uh, generative AI is interesting. And I think what you're talking about, about how you might apply AI technologies to data is a really interesting field that is only a few companies are actually really thinking about this in our space. Everybody else is talking about, oh, how do you stick the AI in, in ter- into the CRM system so that it can help me generate an email, which is great, except I can do that right now. Mm. Um, but what's really interesting is to take the the older versions of AI, right, which is which are really categorization technologies, right, technologies that are great at understanding you know categories and making recommendations about what this thing is. But then generative AI can start to fill in blanks and say, in a document system, this is kind of interesting. Hey, this is blank. We think it should be this. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, there are fascinating potential applications for that in, in a field like yours. I'm curious how you were thinking about it. Sure. I mean, I, I, that's absolutely correct. I mean, I think of an account registration paperwork that has joint custody on it. If it's reading public record and sees that there's a death certificate filed on X person, it could trigger an alert that says, hey, this account registration, you, know, you need to update beneficiaries, you need to do something. Like, that's a very simple application, but I think that it's one that's possible. What I think is interesting is looking at all the data and using AI for, say, because we're, you know, squarely in operations, like you understand that, um, where we can compare different operations and say, hey, you're doing four more steps than your peer group are doing in this workflow. You know, we've corrected it, we've, you know, rerouted all the workflows in your system and we've done it for you, right? So now you're, you're in line with the benchmark. I think that's something that, again, is further out where it's actually identifying and implementing I think humans are going to take a while before they want to let them do the implementing step. But, you know, right, we can start with the triggers, right? Right. And recommendations, right? Yes. Hey, here's, here's a way you could change your workflow based on everything we've seen out in the world. Yeah. And if, would you like to? Yes, no, right? Or think of something, if I'm an operations manager, um, you know, you could say your uh, account paper workflow is up 12% over this time last year. Um, and it's trending towards being up 20%. You may need to put a, open up a rec for, you know, another operation specialist. There's all sorts of things like that that we could really use for AI. I mean, we're, t- we're just scratching the surface with it. Oh, it is very much the dawn of AI. And generative AI is a real game changer in a lot of ways, but it really is just... Um, we think a lot about this at Blue Leaf. We think the entire industry has to be very careful how they apply AI. Mm-hmm. But with the right cautions and guardrails in place it can be a really transformative accelerant for all kinds of pieces of an advisor's business. Yeah, and as a company, we think there's a great opportunity within the service support area. So how can you use AI to help, you know, close customer tickets faster, provide information more accurate and clearer 
um, without people having to wait in a phone queue or wait for a chat to be received. I think that's those. There's still there's some of the like, two yard, three yard gains that we can do pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know what's interesting to me is you know there's a, a, a way of thinking that says technology should be transparent to the customer, right? That the customer shouldn't have to know what's going on, how the sausage is made or how this thing works. They should, you know, you get in a car, you don't, you shouldn't have to know how this car works. You should just be able to put it in drive and go do I things. indeed do not. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you think about these technologies, they're certainly going to make the advisor's experience better potentially, right? To take some of the workload off the advisor, allow the advisor to spend more of their time focused on the client and less of their time on, on paperwork or, or, you know, doing account openings or, or you, we should probably dive into uh, repapering process. Mm -hmm. really, about how, do, how does an advisor move from one, one, one uh, broker dealer to another and, and move their clients with them? But how do you envision this helping that client, right, uh, have a better experience with their wealth manager but not feeling like the technology is driving the show for them? Sure. I mean, I think that's actually a problem and a risk that some wealth managers have today is they've let technology be too much of the experience. So I, I think when we talk about personalization, I think a misnomer about personalization is they talk about the, you know, all this data and all this experience needs to be personalized to the client. Well, I think the advisor and the firm needs to personalize their sort of experience for the client mm. and make, it, make sure that it's different than this sea of sameness that we see. You know, if you look at Almost every wealth manager's website, they offer the same services, they have the same values, the same beliefs, they use the same words. I think there's, there's a real opportunity there to really differentiate yourself in making that experience something specific. Going back to your question about technology, you know, the easiest one is it frees up an advisor's time to spend more time with their clients. However, we know that freeing up more time doesn't mean it's going to be applied in the right manner, right? So, like, just saying I have an afternoon, like, I have an afternoon open doesn't mean I'm productive. Mm -hmm. so. so, I think finding ways to leverage that time in how you can improve what an advisor is doing like it can improve communication right so you can uh you can use that open time to have more communication even just sending an email to, to a client saying hey how are you doing i think you can use like ai to so screen uh if you're friends with on your clients on facebook on linkedin to see when there's a job change or a new announcement and you can reach out and say hey i saw that announcement from your company this week like that's the type of stuff that i think will be much easier uh, and using tools. And the productivity point, I think, is really important. And actually, when we talked last time, you, you raised something about a product called RIA Productivity Suite yes. that, that you, you talked about, and a simplified automated digital toolkit, empowering growth, scale, streamlined operations for advisory firms. It sounds like you're written, putting on a cape. Written by the NBA jargon machine. <laughs> right. it's not, you're putting on a cape, and they're to the moon. But can you talk about that in... Uh, in, in, in terms of what that's really enabling an advisor to do? Sure. So, you know, DocuBase has historically served enterprise broker dealers, so larger firms. So our technology has been used by smaller firms, but really as a conduit through the enterprise firm. As you're seeing the growth of the independent advisory space, the RA space, mature, you're seeing that these firms are growing larger and are needing, in similar need of tools, that they, they have a bunch of point solutions that they had you know, cobbled together over time, or that's really just not, it may work for them today, but not necessarily working for where they want to go. And then you also, there's a giant uh, consolidation within the, the uh, RIA space and within wealth management space in general. So stream, you know, streamlining your processes and getting them digital can make you more acquirable, make you more mergeable as if you want to acquire somebody else, um, and really streamline that business. Plus, if you were to lose a staff member or bring on a staff member, it's easier to do if you have a doc documented process, not, mm. oh, it's in Susie's head, oh, it's in Jimmy's head. So we decided we were going to look at our product and figure out, okay, how can we make the product more viable in the RA market? So in general, our assumption was there's not much in-house technology team. Uh, there's not a project management team. So these are places that are typical within broker dealers. Operations team is generally small. So we created a, a slimmed down version, so more deployable, more out of the box with different integrations and workflows that could give us access to that market and give our product access to our advisors that they can actually run run their RA as an enterprise versus run their RA as a sort of lifestyle firm that they're trying to grow. So it's really bringing the power of enterprise automation in the document space to the small business that is an RA. Absolutely. So the same automation, the same forms bundling, the same, if you were a, if you're an RA with say two branch offices, 25 FAs, um, and you have, 
you know, 80% of your assets with one custodian and 20% with the other. We could provide one system that you can open a, all your accounts, do all your account maintenance and all your account paperwork through DocuPay. That sounds pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. You know, it's funny. You, for years, I think for the last decade and a half or so, we've talked about like an individual advisor could do more than they ever could before because, you know, the Fidelities of the world, the TDs of the world, Schwab's of the world were making solutions available to them so that, you know, basically you can plug and play. You have the invest nets of the world that can do all this, this back office stuff. And it was really helping the advisor scale in some ways. But as you were just talking about, some of the technology, some of the operational components, right, just weren't there. There's, there, you, there's just a lot of human stuff that had to be done. And now having solutions like RA Productivity Suite is allowing somebody to really behave as if they are a multi-advisor shop or, and have several people behind them. Uh, and it's great. Yeah, there's, I mean, 40% of advisors' time, if you look at most recent studies, is spent on administrative work. So still, mm. today, with all the tools, part of that is there's areas of business advisors are still slow to give up. So I think take portfolio management, investment at Orion, other places mm -hmm. provide asset management tools that they could, you know, turn over the key of managing the portfolios to them. But the advisors don't want to do it because they think that's what the clients want or expect from them. So we're still working through that. The, you know, our, let's say our battlefront is really in within people who have processes in their head that we need to get them into a system. And I think, and, and get them to adopt a system, because I think like any technology, you could deploy a system, but then you get people to use the system. And I think that's something that will continue to be a challenge for us, just because it's taking what somebody new and putting it into a new way. And talk a little bit more about that, that rollout process and getting people sort of up to speed with these new processes, because you know, RIAs, small businesses, um, old habits die hard. Um, how do you tackle that challenge to sort of help them implement those new processes? Sure, there's two ways. I think one of the biggest benefits we have is our, the operations manager or the person who actually is feeling the pain in the firm may not be the buyer, like the person who's writing the check, but they're the champion. And they're the ones that would have, whose cheese is going to be moved the most. So I think that's where we actually have a benefit there, an opportunity. And we're improving our client experience in order to help Deliver. I mean, we had to shift all the things, right? So we had a sort of one-to-many training approach, one-to-many many service approach where we would, you know, communicate to the broker-dealer, the broker-dealer would then communicate to their 3,000, 4,000 reps. We've had to flip that on its head to be much more responsive, much more detailed in how we do it, and it's taken us some time, but I think that that's beneficial. So that's one. The second one is just get the boss on board. If the boss is going to write a check, they're going to want them to implement it, right? Because this is their money. I, you you know as well as I know, a dollar from an RA in an investment is dollar out of their pocket. And mm -hmm. so and that's how they see it. So getting make sure you are up front of this is what needs to happen. This is the accountability on our side, this is accountability on your side in order to get it together. That makes a lot of sense. And then measure. So once it's implemented, we got you know, the job's not over. We have to measure how they're using the system to make sure that we can make if there's tweaks that need to be made or if we're actually having the impact that we had hoped. And certainly, any new process that's easier than the old process, that, that's going to win. In the end, yes. In the end. <laughs> <laughs> I want to circle back to something we, uh, I brought up uh, earlier, and, and that's the repapering process, right? The onboarding and the repapering process. So I think these, you mentioned just now, a dollar out of the RA's pocket, it, they want to see an ROI, ROI on that. And, and here's the deal, many advisors will consider changing broker dealers, right? Or they will consider or they think about an M&A type deal. But one of the things that kind of slows them down <laughs> is the notion of like, I may lose some clients or this may take a Absolutely. really long time in moving from one to the other because of the heavy lift of the repapering process. Um, let's dive in a little bit there because I think you at the, and the DocuPace team have solved a lot of that problem. Uh, we try to. So we have an advisor transitions program um, that includes two parts. One, there's a data tool we use with to gather information that's, that could get sucked into applications and, and help get that make that streamlined. But I think when the more important part of the program is we have a team of advisor transition specialists who really hold the advisor's hand through the process, it, like back up and think about. So advisors been with. If you're like most advisors, some advisors bounce around, but not many. So if you're if you're like an advisor, you've been with 
firm for 10, 15, even 20 years. This is how you've built your life and built your business. Well, somebody has you know, either enticed you to move or you've become frustrated or you're just it's time to do something different with your business. So you've made a decision to take this you know, precious thing that you built and the clients that you've earned their trust over time and move them from you know, east to west. Uh, that's really hairy. And I think the process, to, the regulators don't help in the process of making sure that mm. everybody has to be repapered, that all the, you know, there's a lots of rules re regarding account, the client information and what can be gathered at what time and all the steps have to be, you know, to a T and followed in the right process in order to be compliant with, with the change. That's why you see a lot of the news about, you know, this firm is suing this firm for stealing information and other things yeah. that we st stay completely out of that process. So once they made a decision, it needs to be as simple as possible. And I think that that's the thing that, that we're able to take what could be a six month process and narrow it down to 60 days, mostly through our team who helps get the applications in the client's hand and back, either through e-signature or through mail, back as soon as possible and get them on their way. I think that that's, it's been a, I think we're, we're actually at a higher rate of transitions this year than we were last year, which is surprising as we're continuing to see movement in, across the industry. What's interesting about the movement is we always talk about breakaways, but it's a lot of movement within IBD to IBD or mm -hmm. um, other providers. There's not people mostly breaking away um, from so wirehouse to IBD, but there's a lot of movement inside the IB channel as far as hmm. people looking for you know better financial uh, operational metrics mm -hmm. for their firm, better service. Uh, all that's movement and you're seeing to increase. And I think that program will continue to help advisors get to where get there where they want to go, get it, get them safer, and get them there faster. Is there any indication as what is driving the uptick in, in transaction volume or, or, or uh, migration, whatever you want to call it? I think age is one. Yeah. So you've got, if you're a 60-year-old advisor, you've got to make a choice. Mm -hmm. Am I going to stay where I'm at for the rest of my career or am I going to move? Um, the second thing is there's a lot of carrots being dangled. Um, recruiting numbers, the recruiting wars are very high and there's a lot of providers that are, you know, three-year notes or five-year loans in order to, you know, get the assets over. Um, those, I make sure to read the fine details, print of those, because they're all not written the same, and yeah. you want to make sure you don't make a mistake. But I think also, you know, we're at the end of a really big bull run where you could sort of, you know, kick up your feet and, you know, get to a 10 12%, 15% growth yeah. in assets. I, I don't know what's in, ahead of us. That's one thing that's important about the investment world is you don't know what's ahead. But it's probably not that. But it's probably not that, <laughs> at least not anytime soon. So I think there's a lot of thought advisors are doing this. So what can I do to hold on to my business? And also, what can I do to make my business as best as possible? It's so funny. Early on in this podcast series, we had um, uh, Kieran Bowl from McKinsey on. And, and he, they do a study of thousands of financial advisors. And they have direct data feeds. And he said something to the effect of 75% of all growth over the past decade or so for advisors was market driven. And to your point, there was a bull market, right? It was really Absolutely. easy to just make money hand over fist. Mm -hmm. You had to do no extra work to just see your business increase because the markets were going up every single year. And suddenly, like you said, more work. You know, Mike, I think that's often presented as, not a negative, but it's often presented as advisors haven't been growing, but they've been busy, right? So sure. oh, yeah. their, their clients, business has, you know, they're, connection with their client um, has been growing by 10, 15% a year. So those clients are demanding more, needing more. Um, I think it's hard to, you know, I'm a chief marketing officer for DocuBase, so I'm constantly doing that balance between our current clients, current product, and where we're trying to engage in new markets and how mm. make sure both are, um, you know, delivered in, in proper care. I think it's very hard as a, you know, if you're a head of an RA, you're the CEO, you're the founder, you're the you know, you're the bank keeper, bookkeeper, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're all these things, plus an advisor. So I think it's also really hard to mm -hmm. get new clients. It's probably one of the hardest marketing jobs there is across any industry is what financial services professionals have to do. And, I, you know, RAAs, uh, broker-dealer reps take this to insurance, but basically selling financial services is not for the faint of heart. Nope. Because you can't sell it, right? So it's exactly. just, if you if you come off sales, it's bad. So to that point, that's part of a frustration I have is it is very hard, but I don't know why the industry isn't more adjusting to some key demographics that we know to be true. So right now there's more women in the workforce than there are men in the workforce, but yet 
firms are still not, at least on broad brush, aren't a, adjusting to that. Mm -hmm. right? They're still meeting with one spouse or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a big one. I think that that's got to change. The whole, uh, you know, whatever the number is, multi multiple trillion wealth transfer that's you know impending. You know, I don't see a lot of firms that are like wealth transfer for it, right? So they're branding mm -hmm. themselves as how do you, here's how to handle this wealth transfer mm -hmm. thing. Estate taxes are going to go wonky here with regardless of who wins the elections. And so I just think they're missing the opportunity to really set themselves up to actually gather quite mm -hmm. a few clients. Couldn't agree more. And it, it's interesting because I, I, every time I, we talk about this point, and maybe that's because you're good at your job, I come back to you, and man, that's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> man, man, there's a lot of data flying around. <laughs> There's, there's tons of data, and I think keeping the data valid among the different systems is a, is a key challenge. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we help do is, you know, you have the 36-month uh, letter that has to be sent out, and anytime an address change has to be sent out. We want to try to minimize that because that's just cost on a lot of advisory firms and wealth management firms, especially when it gets returned, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I, back in my broker-dealer days, I used to work at First Global. We would hire temps around the holidays just to sort the return mail, and they thought mm -hmm. that was wait, 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 so we're sending it out, it's coming back to us, and then we're paying somebody to sort what's art that didn't make any sense at all, still doesn't make any sense at all, um, and that's just another way that things can be improved. You know, it's funny, you just made me think of something, you know, um, we have, uh, my in-laws are, are now in an assisted living facility, right, and so the, the siblings and, and everybody, there's been a lot of the paperwork and the navigation of this just new realm for people, right? Mm -hmm. And to your point, from an advisor's perspective, not only are you helping your clients manage their portfolios and so forth, they, they, there's a, they have a lot of documents, a lot of information that they're trying to take in, and you could really serve your client well by helping them navigate that type of stuff a little better as well. Yeah, it's not as comforting when the files that they give you are in a box in Iron Mountain mm -hmm. at the bottom of a dusty bin yeah. um, versus just being able to punch up and be, you know, pull mm -hmm. up at any time. A lot of it's about confidence that you you create by having that at the at the tip of your fingers, right? Well, and that's where the technology comes in. If the technology is clunky and your systems don't work together, or you have gaps in your system, I think that confidence can get eroded. And it all depends on how you portray yourself to the client. But if you're you know have a clients in the in the office and you're putting up paperwork and you're like, oh, this doesn't work, and oh, this doesn't work, and you're not fluent in the system. Fluid in the process, they may, they may pull that check on a little tighter before they hand it over. <laughs> Making that difficult job yeah. even more difficult. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I know we're, we're kind of getting towards the end of the podcast, but I, I think no, this... No, no, I know, I know, no, but listen, <laughs> <laughs> this actually might take... We might actually find ourselves talking about this for like the next like, 15, 20 uh -oh. minutes here. Um, I, I, I kind of titled this section the, the, uh, On the Cusp of a New Frontier, right? Because uh, I really do think we are in the early innings, you know, we talked about uh, AI and so forth and, and some technologies that are coming on that are poised to not only help the advisor, but help your back office heroes, by the way, recent back office mm -hmm. heroes day created by our friends at DocuPays. Um, but these are creating some kind of woe moments, like this new technology, you know, like we, we talked about chat GPT. Mm -hmm. I just tinkered around with Google's Bard the other day. I'm like, oh my God, that is pretty really, interesting. really cool. Um, we talked about it a bit, but as you're starting to think about the next decade, how do you think, whether it's AI or, or other solutions, where do you think we're going? What, what are some of you think, think some of the things we're going to see that make advisors wealth management experience better and by extension clients wealth management experience better? So I'm a, I like television, I like film, I like other things. I'm a big fan of the West Wing. Um, okay. Back, you know, back in the '90s and 2000s, one of the things that always stuck out to me: one, the writing was great, and they're always walking, talking, doing all those things. But the president was always surrounded by advisors, right? Mm -hmm. So he had all these people that were smart, who knew this field or that field, and they could pose questions, and they would get, mm -hmm. you know, talk smart, smart, smart. Um, people with Bard and ChatGPT, everybody has access to that. They have their own advisor that can sit next to them and ask them a question. If they're sitting at their desk and they want to know how do you approach your boss about X. Mm -hmm. They can get, I mean, it's not necessarily going to answer it for you, but it can provide some perspective. So I think that if people go in that direction, I think we all become smarter, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's just that, that advisor that can work for us. I think the other thing is we're going to have to find ways to where the human connection is salient and differentiated among different technologies, right? So 
I think I could probably tell you if I get a you know market commentary that was written by AI and one that was written by an advisor. Like think of Bill Gross's old you know mm -hmm. quarterly commentaries sure. that were AI couldn't write that because it was from his head and from his perspective. Warren Buffett's annual shareholder yes, letter, right? Absolutely. Like that's the direction I think professional services need to go because it's the personal brand. It's I am, have the wisdom and the trust that you have put in me. It's interesting though. Not everyone's a Warren Buffett or a Bill Gross. So, so advisors really need to take those tools and leverage them to make them more of who they are, right? Mm. Not everyone is going to be able to create some great missive that everybody, that's really entertaining, but they may know everyone's birthday and, and know really what it is that that client wants and desires. And it's finding a way to amp that feature of, of their brand. Uh, and I think that's a place where these technologies are really interesting. They are really amplifiers and accelerants. They're not replacements in any way, shape, or form. I was listening to a podcast the other day, again, about AI. Um, but it was, it was an interesting dialogue, which was, hey, the writing is getting better. But it's, a, it's a, like a junior writer who sort of kind of gets it but really needs an expert editor to make it make it really right. And so you can get it some of the way. It can get you started. It's a real accelerant. You can go much faster than you could before. But if you want this to be you, it still requires you. And, and so I think there's a whole new skill set coming for advisors and, frankly, everyone else in the workplace for how do you work with and leverage these kinds of acceleration technologies and, and I think it's going to be a new era where we need to know ourselves even better. Like, what makes me me? Why am I special? I mean, besides that I'm handsome. <laughs> I'm not well, of course. You're handsome, you know? I, I mean, I think part of that is, um, just fair warning, marketers will screw this up. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> you put an automation tool in hands of a marketer, they're going to go crazy. They're going to send out all sorts of stuff. So we've got to figure out how to normalize some of that um, and not just automate bad, you know, bad text and bad content and blast it out. The, you know, I think the source in, in today's day and age where all this stuff is misinformation and things are spinning around, the source of the information is critical. If the, yeah. you're an advisor or professional and the source of information is you, you need to protect that and make sure that that is built into something that's valuable. I, I love that you're saying that because advisors frequently advise and warn their clients to stay off of the CNBCs and then the, the Fox business. Bye, bye, bye. So, right? so, so. Yeah, stay away from that because. Yeah. And which one of those clients listen? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the, the hard part is you're going to have your clients now tinkering around with tools and asking questions. Sure. Right. So just like when you go into your doctor's office, you might've said, I went on a WebMD, oh, no. and oh, yeah. I checked all these symptoms. Right. I think I have, you know, as George Costanza say, I have lupus, you know, like, <laughs> right. uh, I have a problem. Be prepared for your clients to come in. Like, I asked XYZ AI tool, whatever it is, sure. about this, and it said this. So you might want to start, like, being mm -hmm. at least fluent in that, right, and being able to respond. Sure, and also knowing your clients and what, you know, Absolutely. we all have the warrior work clients. We all have the people who won't care, the people... Um, you know, in that, again, knowing both spouses are, you know, both people in the relationship is important because I think of like my parents, I was just at home visiting my parents this weekend. My dad is 72, my mom is 70. And every time I see my dad, should I sell? Things are going to get worse. And I tell him, <laughs> absolutely, things are going to get worse. And no, you shouldn't sell. <laughs> um, because that's just, the, those are the two truths that we could hold on to. Right? Yeah, yeah. Funny. It, it is funny, like the, you know, <laughs> the, everybody who knows you're in the finance industry wants to ask you what's going to happen in the 2008, market. 2008, 2009. All oh, the time. It's how I founded Blue Leaf. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 2008. I'm an investment banker, people. So I had taken a break from all my product work over the years. Uh, and I get panicked calls from friends and relatives, et cetera. The crazy part was advisors who I knew were calling me asking me what to do because, well, it's a financial crisis, right? I'm in finance. Mm. I, I, I know people who've d sold these crappy mortgages. What do I do? Like, well, do what you do, man. You're a pro. You, you should know what's going on. And uh, it, was, it was interesting to see the pros even have 
trouble with this. We are all emotional, right? We all struggle with those kinds of choices. We all need an advisor. And, and we all need a, a simplified way to see the world, especially in times of crisis. So when I think about tools like DocuPace and the way that it can bring all of this together and simplify that information and make people feel a lot more comfortable, right? Um, Blue Leaf does a similar thing, but with the reporting data. Mm -hmm. It can really kick into gear when folks are on CNBC, but they've got an anchor that is their reality, not this market voice, market noise. They understand you know, their picture, they see the full thing, and it becomes different than what's happening in the market over time. That's very true. I mean, I think finding that balance, and I struggle with this myself, which is being informed and being overly tied into, like, my wife and I watch ABC World News tonight. Literally, first lines of every program is, breaking news tonight. It's like, well, yeah, because it's 6.30 and it's coming on, <laughs> on, coming on. Like, it's, so you have to find that balance. Like, now what's going on with the debt ceiling talks? Sure. Every machination of the debt ceiling talks gets broadcast like it's the end of the world or the, you know, it's, you have to find a way to stay informed but not get emotional about exactly. it. Exactly, yeah. and sort of and find that thing that is informs you about your reality. What's your part of part in this, rather than getting caught up in the soap opera that is our media? Yeah, no, it's fantastic. So it's the old uh, steady hand at the wheel. I always say that's why somebody's hiring an advisor, right? Like to take Absolutely. the emotion out of it, because I can do the tech. Just what anybody could, you know, do the technical stuff, get a you know model portfolio, plug, you know, set it, forget it. But there is going to be things that come up in life where you're going to want that your advisor's help. Well, and and you said take the emotion out of it. I'd say it differently. I think it is help you deal with the emotion because money is nothing if not emotional, right? It it is. It's the essence of emotion, right? And if you think about it, money is nothing but meaning, mm. right? It doesn't, it doesn't exist except insofar as we deem it to exist. And so it embodies all of the things we're, we hope and all the things we fear. And in some ways, the advisor's chief job is to take what I think and believe and want and marry it up with those things about money that I think and believe and fear, right? Um, a really tr a true guide, and which is why all these technologies are actually so important and so critical, because that's not a job AI can do. Mm. That's not a job that you hand off to a model portfolio. That requires a human to another human. So you get get them out of the back office. You automate all that paperwork. You you standardize and simplify and automate the reporting so that. You're not having this big quarterly reporting period every time that people are getting the regular information that says, no, no, this is your situation, Yeah. right? And now I can have a dialogue that's long-term about what you believe, think, hope, want, and what's really happening for you. Because on that point, can I make one more point? Oh, so please do, the, yeah. Oh, sure, so do it. On that point, we don't I think, have a time constraint, I, I just so you know. all of us are sort of have three battles we're fighting. One is the person I was, the person I am today and the person I want to be. And the money, that's where money and planning all comes into it. It's the person I was, is, did I save enough? Have I planned enough? Have I set my career gone? How's, I, how's it to go? Then the person I am today, which is how am I existing in this world? Am I you know, happy with what I'm doing? And then there's, are we aligned with, what's the top end I can go? Like, what's, the, what's my bandwidth, right? So what are my, my Bollinger Bands, to use a t term as far as my top and bottom of where I'm going? And I think money has a large tie into that because when people get, you know, have to, I saw the statistic of like 40% of people of Americans dipped into their 401ks, I think last year or the year before last, um, do hardship withdrawals, which is, that's just, it's just, um, it breaks my heart because I feel like these people, that's a, like their Bollinger Band just comes a little bit down is what they want to do. And I think mm -hmm. that that's, that's the important of what this business does is try to keep people in line of what, of those three things of where they want to be. Yeah. Great, great point. Well, I think we're, uh, we're nearing an end here. I think we've said it all. I know. Exactly. Anyways. Words are done. <laughs> the words are done. Well, Ryan George, thank you so very much for coming on the show. Really appreciate you making the drive over here. Great to meet you in person. Hey, yeah. my podcast. Yeah, exactly. Podcast. Maybe we'll do this again sometime. We'll just like crushing it. Love it. I guess <laughs> I'm coming back to Texas, folks. Let's do it. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, all of you who are watching, thank you very much for listening or watching. You should have been watching this episode of the show. You can find more episodes of the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, the YouTubes, wherever you like to get your podcast you jam get, on. Anywhere you get your podcast exactly. jam. 
Well, thanks, guys. See ya. Bye.